Hi, thanks. Margarita, Glenn, wherever you are, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I, this is, it's an interesting thing. I've been looking at this issue for a long time before a lot of people were out of high school, I can tell. Uh, but in, in the December 1992, I was in Latvia and, uh, and Estonia, and I had to stay at hotels in each of the capitals, and I, but the only way I could get through the night was to sleep in my clothes with multiple blankets over me. The reason was the Russians had cut off the natural gas and oil, actually. And that was my first exposure to the Russian use of energy as a political weapon. In that case, they were trying to uh, weaken some of the, the uh, tendency to break loose from Russia. They were trying to keep Russian uh, soldiers, Russian officers in Latvia and Estonia, whereas the Estonians and Latvians wanted to get, the, get them out of there. I was also in Estonia on the August 30th, I guess, 1994, when the last soldier left the country, and I went around the country and I said, God, how do you feel today? And everybody, I thought they'd be ecstatic, and everybody said, oh, they'll be back. Everybody to the person. So it was, it was kind of an interesting experience. Then in 1997, 2000, I lived in Lithuania and watched the Russians cut off the supply of oil to the Druzhba pipeline there uh, nine times, nine times in two years. So uh, then in 2006, the Russians uh, severed the whole connection uh, that took oil to the, to the Majeka refinery in Lithuania and to the port of event spills in Latvia. So I go, I go way back on this, and then in, I was in Ukraine when uh, the pipeline, the gas was knocked off, I think it was 2005. And then in 2009, 2006, I guess it was 2009, you had where the gas was cut off and uh, again. But this time, the Russians made a mistake because they left it on long enough and the Ukrainians were smart enough to let it affect the Western Europe. And once that happened, the EU policy on uh, energy security changed enormously. Up until then, really the EU didn't care. They, the the West, Central Europeans didn't have much clout. I was asked to go to the EU in, I uh, forgot the exact year, about 10 years ago, to testify before a hearing of the joint uh, European Parliament, European Commission about Nord Stream 1. You remember that one, don't you? Vlad is old enough to remember. And uh, I remember asking some questions of the panel, the EU panel, about the implications for Central Europe. And nobody seemed to have a clue that was uh, either from the Commission or the Parliament that was on this board. And every major question I asked I was referred to a guy in the audience. Oh, he'll know the answer. Well, this happened to be Matthias Varnig, the former Stasi officer who was the go-between between Schroeder and Putin. And that was how the EU dealt with this back in the old days. Today, that wouldn't happen. And thanks to 2009, to an enforcement, to, to some extent of the third energy package, things have changed enormously. They turned around, and in the Baltic states now, a lot of this stuff I was going to cover has been covered, so I'll try to deal with a little bit of different stuff. You now have uh, energy connections between Latvia and Finland, two connections, in fact, S-Link 2 and 1 and 2. You have an electricity grid connection between Lithuania and Poland, and now between Lithuania and, Pol and uh, Sweden. And there's going to be gas, natural gas connections uh, between these same countries in the future. Then you're going to have a, probably you have the Lithuan the LNG point port that uh, Matt and others talked about in Cl Port of Klaipeda in Lithuania, and you're going to have an LNG port either in Estonia or Latvia that the EU will support. So the position of the Russians in in that part of the world has weakened significantly, so, which is great, because they had enormous enormous uh, clout. And back when I was in Lithuania. We were the targets under the cover. The Russians sent in a new ambassador, I remember, in 1998, I guess it was, who had, for 25 years, had been the KGB liaison between the energy companies and the KGB. And of course, the first thing that happened was certain newspapers, which would, were going under, suddenly got full of life, financial life, and beginning to attack the United States' position on energy. So, but a lot of this has changed, and you can see that these companies, these countries have really pushed back, and with a great deal of support, financial support, in building two-way electricity grids, two-way natural gas lines, 
into uh, East Central Europe, and the Baltic states has benefited enormously from this. And I, and I think things will continue in that direction. Also, we're supposed to be talking about Ukraine also, and we have uh, those of you who've watched Ukraine since 2014, uh, and after the cutoff, unfortunately, the first cutoff in 2006, which only lasted, I think, four days, you had a lot of corruption within the uh, Yushchenko government, which was a real disappointment, and somehow a, a deal was struck with the Russians, and things went on pretty much the way they were before. Russia has used Ukraine, as, a, as, as has been mentioned many times here, as a, a bank to um, launder money and go offshore. In fact, I have personal, a personal experience with a gentleman, uh, uh, Dmitro Firtash, who founded uh, Rus, uh, first Eurotrans Gas and then Ross Uker Energo. And then he tried to sue me in London and Washington when I mentioned on hung in Hungary that he was involved in a lot of money laundering and, and corrupt practices. But he's now under indictment, by, not just by the United States, but by Spain. So things are beginning to improve, as far as I'm concerned. If he's indicted and flown to Dulles Airport, I'll be out there cheering, uh, uh, and for many reasons for that. It made my life miserable for a while. And, but anyway, this is, these are very, very important things. But the EU, though, I think the things, there's been a dramatic change. And the fact that the EU is discussing these the third energy package and enforcing it is good. But as Alan Riley, sitting in the front row, has told me many times how the EU is going to enforce the competition policy with Gazprom, I'm still waiting. <laughs> They'll like to impose it on Google and Apple and the rest of them. But when it comes to Gazprom, the Russians make a threat that, well, if you enforce, uh, uh, if you try to find Gazprom because of their prior uh, behavior in Europe, then we'll take it, we'll go after European businesses in Russia. And that's been enough to scare off, I think, a lot of the EU enforcement uh, people. Anyway, so I think that things, things are improving, but there, it's a mixed blag. And I think one thing that's been left out, there's been a lot of, some talk about, uh, there was some talk just, just recently about the, the increase in demand in a lot of countries like India and, and China, and some probably in Europe. But the other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the gas fields in Europe are declining. Uh, the, the Dutch gas field, which has been a very, very powerful one in supplying Europe, Western Europe with gas, is probably 80% depleted. Uh, the Nord Stream pipe, the uh, Nordic, uh, sorry, the Norwegian fields are beginning to decline somewhat. The, Nor the North Sea pipelines that supplied Britain and others from uh, the North Sea are beginning to decline. So there is also, we have to keep in mind, and the US, in no way can the US supply uh, these markets. We can supply some, but there's going to be, I think, a future for Russian gas. We have to face that. I don't think it's through Nord Stream 2. I think there's already an oversupply, and Nord Stream 2 uh, is, a, is not an economic thing. If the Russians were really interested in building a real uh, additional pipelines to Europe, they could just make a Yamal 2 pipeline, the Yamal pipeline which goes through Belarus and uh, Poland. They already have the right-of-ways for a, another pipeline to go through there, and it would be very, very easy to build. They already have the pumping stations and everything else that could, could supply that. But they've refused to do it because that doesn't give them what they want is to go directly from, uh, from the uh, ports near uh, St. Petersburg to Germany, bypassing a lot of these other countries, so theoretically they could be cut off again, uh, like Poland. If Poland is coming up for a renewal of its negotiation, its long-term uh, energy agreement or uh, gas agreement with Russia, and they can put a little heat on, on Poland as far as price and availability if the Poles don't cooperate up to some extent. So we have to figure out a way to increase supplies, not just from the U.S., but encourage Norway uh, in many ways to increase uh, exploration in the North Sea. Uh, there's also, uh, I think, a, uh, we have some influence with other countries. Qatar, which, is, uh, which has got uh, an agreement with Poland in the long run. There's a lot of things we can do 
uh, that I think will help, help, I'm sorry, supply Europe at a time when a lot of the European gas fields are declining. Another thing we can do, which I think we should be doing, is pressing the Europeans a little bit more on the whole issue of technology and, and domestic supply. I mean, there's all this mythology in Europe about fracking and how fracking is such a horrible system of pulling out gas or, and, and or oil from the ground. And we've, had, you, we've been able to prove that, in fact, Moscow was very, very uh, busy in trying to uh, convince Europeans that these are dangerous things. We, in fact, there was, when I was going back and forth to Poland, we knew that there was, we, we were able to pinpoint a, a woman, a, a lawyer who was, a Czech lawyer who was living in Krakow, who was receiving large sums of money from France. And some of that money could be traced to Russia and some of it could be traced to German uh, uh, Greens. And the whole idea of the two groups was to try to stop fracking in there. In Germany, you had a situation where the Germans now, we've talked about this, are closing the nuclear power plants and trying to go to renewables. Meanwhile, the German Greens have, have forced the country to ban, totally ban fracking. Well, fracking took place in Germany from 1955 until about three years ago. And it took place uh, in, I think it was, I forgot now which, which lender it was in. Anyway, they drilled over 155 uh, uh, wells, some of them with some vertical um, uh, characteristics. No problems. They never had a spill. They never had a, a leak or anything like that. Everything went fine until uh, a, a person from that lender was, spoke up, a young guy, at a, at a meeting of the EU Environment Committee in, in Brussels and said, gee, we've had great experience with uh, hydraulic fracturing in Germany. And what happened? Immediately, the Greens pounced on that, went to the, the federal government, and had it all stopped. So to some extent, Europe's problems are their, their own damn fault, quite frankly. I think that they've made some big mistakes in that area. They've accepted the fact that, uh, except for now in around some, some parts of central Brit uh, England, that fracking is a dangerous form. The prices of fracking have gone down, so it's very competitive if done properly. The prices of, uh, price of fracking in the United States has diminished by 50% 50, 50 in the last five years. And it's going to continue to go down. So instead of grabbing onto that technology, there, I think they have their heads in the sand on that. But in any case, I think that uh, we have an obligation to point out to the Europeans not, and it's been mentioned here, we, that the worst thing is to go to the Europeans and say, we, we, we don't think you should support Nord Stream 2 because we want to sell you natural gas, LNG. I mean, that, that makes it look so crass commercial. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> But I think we can, there's a lot of things we can do to kind of encourage Europeans to look farther afield to develop their own resources. <clears throat> and I think that uh, that's something that I would like to see us do instead of, instead of being in Berlin and talking about the wonders of, of, of coal and, and producing coal. What a stupid thing. I can't believe it. Anyway, I'll let you talk about the intelligence stuff. Margarita, go ahead. I will be very brief about the implications for the Balkans. Uh, you see on the, on the screen a map of, of data from uh, Gazprom export. Your mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, you see on the screen um, data from Gazprom expo export uh, uh, from their website, uh, which says that in 2016. Uh, Gazprom has imported 178 BCM to Europe, including Turkey. 25 BCM of this is going to Turkey. So about 150 BCM apparently has gone to the European market. One third of it is delivered to Germany. Uh, and uh, this is actually the, the biggest consumer of uh, Gazprom in, in Europe. The next biggest is uh, France with uh, just over 11, followed by Poland, uh, 11 BCM per year. So when we compare this data, the big, uh, the big numbers, Poland, 11 BCM, um, and then uh, Czech Republic about four and a half, maybe uh, Slovakia close to four, 
these are still relevant numbers. And then we look at the Balkans and we see what the Russian, um, what the Russian import is to the Balkans. Yes. Uh, the Russian import to the Balkans in 2016, including Slovakia, Romania, and Greece, was only 9.9 .9 BCM. Under 10 BCM of cubic of uh, a billion cubic meters of gas imported to the Balkans, for this relatively small amount of gas that only one country could consume, such as Romania or Poland, uh, Russia is having enormous political influence in the Balkans, using particularly the the energy tool as the main tool of subversion of the Balkan governments. Uh, because they have no other choice. This is the only reason. They have no choice. Although gas is a, a very small proportion of the energy mix, and you can read about the, all the Balkan countries in, in the book uh, Azerbaijan in the uh, new energy geopolitics uh, in Southeast Europe. We did a study of each country what are they? What is the energy mix, and uh, how they rely on what kind of sources they rely? And we came to the conclusion that uh, the region is still very much dependent on coal, um, uh, still not going out of it. Although the renewable energy sector is developing pretty rapidly, uh, the gas sector is still very, very small. It might grow. Uh, the economy is developing, probably uh, uh, actually growing faster than uh, in West, Western Europe, in some of the Eastern European countries. They will be consuming more gas in the future, but these numbers are going to be still relatively very, very small. They can never reach Germany's number of 50 BCM for the entire Balkan region. Uh, and this is why uh, if Nord Stream comes to effect, then the trans, uh, and, and Turk Stream as well, Turkey Stream, this trans-Balkan pipeline that goes from Ukraine down to the, to, through Bulgaria, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Greece, and going to Turkey, might become defunct, might become unnecessary. That line the Russians pretty much want to close down so that uh, no gas is coming from Ukraine down to the Balkans. That line su uh, supports, uh, supplies not only Bulgaria, also supplies Macedonia. Um, this is the only way there is a uh, um, there is a branch that goes to Macedonia. But Macedonia, as a consumer, is 0 0.07 BCM a year. This is the small, very small amount of gas, that volume of gas that Macedonia consumes. Uh, so if that pipeline is closed, it's very interesting plan what the Balkan countries have developed for that they actually want to develop a so-called um, East Ring pipeline from Turkey connected to the uh, Southern Gas Corridor coming from Azerbaijan that Vlad is going to talk about and going all the way to Western Europe so that they have um, a usage of, uh, of other, another pipeline through connectors to Central Eastern Europe and use that Trans-Balkan pipeline in reverse from the Southern Gas Corridor up north to Ukraine, Moldova, through Romania, Moldova to Ukraine. So is that possible? Probably it is possible when there are enough volumes in the Southern Gas Corridor to supply that pipeline with gas. But this is one of the plans that exist already. The Balkans countries have been pretty silent about Nord Stream 2. They are not uh, very vocal, not as vocal as the Baltics and Poland and Ukraine. Uh, but this is going to affect them for sure. It is going to affect also uh, Hungary and Slovakia. It is going to cut them off from, uh, from uh, uh, gas coming from the eastern direction. That co probably is going to make more difficult supplying Ukraine with gas on the reverse flow from Slovakia and Hungary. And this should be taken into account when we evaluate the uh, uh, the consequences of uh, Nord Stream 2. I'll stop here. The, not uh, too much to talk about the Balkans, but the Southern Go Gas Corridor is covering this part better. Hmm. 
Thank you. I will uh, start with uh, some remarks about Ukraine, not duplicating what has already been said. And then I'll go on to Germany, and then finally to the Southern Corridor. Uh, regarding transit from Ukraine, I'd like to quote the position of the European Commission, which is, Ukraine's transit route to Europe is necessary, safe, and must be retained beyond the expiration of the current transit agreement with Gazprom in 2019. The European Commission is ready to mediate between Russia and Ukraine in order to prolong or renew the transit protocol beyond 2019. In contrast to this, the common position of Vladimir Putin, Alexei Miller, Angela Merkel, and other members of the German government is, Ukraine may return, may retain a transit volume of 15 BCM per year, presumably for transit to the Southeast European countries. The current transit volume is 80 BCM per year. The common Ger German and Russian position would allow 15. This is unsustainable because it could not cover the maintenance and repair expenses for Ukraine's vast transit system. 15 BCM is as good as zero in terms of perpetuating the life of Ukraine's transit system. Those 15 BCM that uh, Moscow and Berlin would allow roughly coincide with the annual volume of Ukrainian transit, gas transit in the direction of Southeastern Europe, which is up to 19 BCM annually. The transit agreement expires in 2019, December. That is also the year when, North, when the first string of Nord Stream 2 is due to become operational. And in 2020, the second string of Nord Stream 2 will become operational. Therefore, the transit protocol with Russia ought to be renewed before December 2019. It is a matter of urgency. We are dealing here under time pressure. And to buy that time, it would be necessary for the European Commission to be successful in what it has recently, only recently, proposed to bring the offshore Nord Stream pipeline under the jurisdiction of European energy legislation, which is now the latest issue under discussion. Regarding German policy, what is seldom being discussed, at least in the English-speaking media, is that Gazprom offers to turn Germany into the main transit route, storage site, and distribution hub for Russian gas in Europe. Ukraine had until now been the main transit route. It was not uh, a distribution hub. Russia is holding out that enormous prize to Germany. 110 BCM per year, or much of it, would become the object of German companies trading and brokering with third countries. This promises enormous revenues to the German federal budget, to the budgets of the German lender that will provide transit service, and to German middleman companies. It has also created, it is creating, we see it burgeoning in Germany, a whole structure of interest groups that are vested in this type of cooperation with Russia, hoping in effect to piggyback on Russia's gas export flow. This ironically is being done largely at the expense of Russia. Because Russia will bear, or Gazprom rather, would bear a large share of the costs of building these transit systems via Germany. 
On German, in Germany, over land, there is a whole system of pipelines evolving and now almost close to completion that would carry gas from Nord Stream via German territory over land to third European countries. The main pipelines, they, they are called Opal, Nell, and Ugal, they add up to a total capacity of 110 BCM, matching Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 combined. These pipelines and the storage sites are co-owned by Gazprom with German companies on EU territory, overland, not offshore, we're talking about overland pipelines, in contradiction to the EU's legislation which requires unbundling, and in contradiction to the European Union's external energy policy goals, which require diversifi diversification. German influence in the European Union, in Brussels, has proven thus far too strong to be overcome. Much of these ro Russian gas volumes may and probably will reach Central Europe, even Southeastern Europe, via Germany, if this system is operationalized. No longer directly from Russia via Ukraine into Central Europe and Southeastern Europe, but on the circuitous way, on the roundabout way, via the Baltic Sea, southwards into Germany, and then southwards and eastwards into Central Europe. A key juncture, uh, juncture, pipeline junction in this system is that of Baumgarten, near Vienna. Gazprom has promised to turn Baumgarten into an enormous continental gas hub. In the case of Baumgarten, hub is a misnomer. It is very tough for a, uh, for a landlocked country to become a hub. A, a country with access to the shore can be, become a hub. But Baumgarten, moreover, will no, is not and will not be receiving gas from a variety of suppliers, as, the case, as is the case with hubs. All the pipes would converge from Russia to Baumgarten. So this would be a sort of a pseudo-hub, but of course it is extremely attractive to the Austrians. Uh, moving on to the south. A postscriptum about Germany. Uh, this is, to some extent, a déjà vu. There was a first attempt by Russia to motivate Germany to become a European, an all-European distribution hub for Russian gas in 2006. In that year, President Putin offered to Chancellor Angela Merkel, who was one year in office, or even in her first year in office, to do Germany this favor on the strength of Russian gas from the Stockmann project in the Barents Sea. Stockmann, if you remember, had two uh, phases, one phase for continental pipeline deliver gas and one phase for LNG. The LNG was going to go to America, that collapsed because of the LNG revolution in America itself. Uh, but the pipeline delivered gas was to be, was to converge to the system of pipelines to Germany, and Germany was uh, going to have the privilege of marketing, re storing, marketing, reselling that gas to third countries in Europe. Uh, Angela Merkel at that time, as chancellor in her first year in office, declined that offer. She is now very much behind the second offer from Russia. There is a German national consensus on this. It has been, during the bipartisan Christian Democrat, Social Democrat coalition governments, it has been a consensus policy in Germany. I would say that the Social Democrat Party 
uh, was a fellow traveler with this policy, but not its driver. The driver were the main energy companies and the banks friendly to the energy companies and to Russia. What the uh, German Social Democrat Party did was to add to this policy an ideological ingredient, that of Ostpolitik, and the corruption ingredient, that of Gerhard Schroeder and some other figures in that same party. I can also think of a mayor of, former mayor of Hamburg who was deeply involved in this. Uh, in the new uh, would-be coalition government, the Green Party is against it, is against Nord Stream for the wrong reasons, but it's against Nord Stream. At the same time, the Green Party is pushing for the irreversible abandonment of nuclear energy and for the abandonment of coal. Both of these moves would increase demand for pipeline-delivered gas from Russia in the absence of LNG terminals in uh, Germany. But in the short term, the Greens are completely against Nord Stream, and it is possible to work politically with Greens on that. Let me move now to the uh, Southern Corridor. It, uh, it would be no exaggeration to say that the Southern Corridor would not have existed, the chance would not have a reason for it to exist without a consistent policy over the long term on the part of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is the sine qua non factor in the Southern Corridor. The European Union, for all the support of the European Commission, the European Union would not have been able to bring it about without Azerbaijan. It, was, it is Azerbaijan who supplies the resource base. Thanks to Azerbaijan's long-term policy of exclusive orientation of its energy exports to the West. Azerbaijan has thrown its national lot with the West in this regard. So Azerbaijan has provided the only, the only gas resource available thus far for the Southern Corridor. The state oil company of Azerbaijan and the state oil fund of Azerbaijan have reinvested oil revenues into making Azerbaijan into a major gas exporter. The oil and, uh, oil and gas sector in Azerbaijan is clean of corruption. It is a corruption-free island in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has major problems with corruption, but not in the oil and gas uh, sector. It was Azerbaijan's state oil company who came up with the concept of the Southern Corridor, the planning, the execution of the TANAP pipeline, which is the mainstay of the Southern Corridor, covering exactly one half of its total length. And it was also Azerbaijan who has shouldered the lion's share of financing for TANAP, the Trans-Anatolia uh, gas pipeline, stretching from the Azerbaijan-Georgia border, stretching from the uh, Georgia-Turkey border to the, Georgia, to, to the Turkey-European Union border. All this became possible because of Azerbaijan's long-term Western orientation in terms of energy exports, because of long-term political stability in Azerbaijan, which in turn enabled strategic planning. And thanks to the fact that Sokar, the state owned company, has become, in the course of almost two decades, a mature, sophisticated, state energy company of an international caliber. Sources of gas, uh, Shah Deniz, phase one, six BCM, phase two, uh, 16 BCM, export commitments, six uh, for Turkey, uh, 10 for European Union countries, one, almost one, for Georgia. Azerbaijan's total output at present is 29 BCM per year, but there is in the offing what is called a second wave of Azerbaijani gas, from fields to be, op to be uh, opened by after 2020, Absheron, the most important one, from 2023 onward, with a plateau production of 5 BCM per year uh, after 2023, developed jointly by Azerbaijan with a French company, Total. Total capacity of the uh, Southern Corridor 
design capacity 23 BCM per year, easily scalable to 31 BCM per year with, maximal invest with minimal investment through the addition of compressor capacity. The question is, what are the sources uh, in addition to Azerbaijani gas? Turkmen gas comes to mind. It's far from settled, but it is a possibility. A risk is that Gazprom might uh, attempt to use part of the Southern Corridor's capacity in order to introduce Gazprom gas value, uh, volumes into the pipeline. This would be a step back from the policy of diversification. We see that diversification at its best in the Southern Corridor. That is a new supplier country, a new gas resource, a new counterpart, counterpart being the supplier company, and new contracts. All four diversification criteria of the EU policy are met by the Southern Corridor. New, res new supplier country, new resource, new counterpart, new contracts. Marketing of, uh, of Shark Denis gas is practically ensured, I would say almost guaranteed, by the fact that when the project was launched in 2013, the shareholders in Shark Denis and in the Southern Corridor concluded binding commercial sale and purchase agreements with nine major West European gas uh, cust uh, customer companies. There is an Italian dimension to this, and it's a very important dimension. To some extent, to a large extent, it works to, a de to the detriment of the, of the Southeast European companies. Italy, thanks to the Southern Corridor, is beginning to fulfill its national policy goal of becoming a major transit country for gas to Europe. The Italian market is oversaturated with gas from multiple directions. It is highly differentiated with pipeline delivered gas and LNG gas from multiple directions, north, south, east, west, and now also east. Italy does not need these volumes mainly for its own consumption, but for purposes of transiting these volumes along the Italian peninsula into the heartland of Europe. Most of the Shark Denis gas volumes will transit south-north along the Italian peninsula. And this means that the countries of, the, of southeastern Europe, those that would have been crossed by the Nabucco pipeline, will not get the transit bonanza. The Nabucco project has failed, and has failed for justifiable reasons, for internal weaknesses of its own. And so the transit bonanza will go, for the most part, to Italy. Turkish stream, and I'll conclude with this. Again, there is a case of deja vu, in part. Turkish stream is the successor project of Gazprom's South Stream project, which was on the table from 2007 until 2014. At that time, I described uh, South Stream's uh, objectives, both uh, political and economic objectives, as follows. And I'll mention this because uh, we encountered this in a modified form in, South, in Turkish Stream. So the first objective of South Stream was to pressure Ukraine, blackmail Ukraine into ceding control of Ukraine's transit system to Gazprom under the threat of Ukraine being bypassed. Threat which would have meant turning Ukraine's gas transit pipelines into scrap iron. So under this threat of, South, of being bypassed to South Stream, Ukraine was to be pressured into ceding its, the control of its uh, transit system to Gazprom before 2014. The second uh, goal was to kill Nabucco by duplicating Nabucco's transit route and by targeting the same markets as Nabucco did. And the third uh, goal was to entice, incentivize countries, members of the European Union in Southeastern and Central Europe into breaking the EU legislation third package by teaming up with Gazprom 
in this transit project. So at that time, I described these three goals of South Stream as Ukraine blackmailer, Nabucco killer, and EU lawbreaker. We find again the similar goals behind Turkish Stream in a modified version. This time, the goal is no longer to blackmail Ukraine into ceding control over its pipeline system, but it is simply to eliminate Ukraine altogether as a transit country because of the domestic political changes in Ukraine since 2014. Russia has given up on the goal of taking over Ukraine's system. It now wants to eliminate Ukraine as a transit country. Uh, that's uh, number one. Uh, the second goal is to piggyback on the transit corridor and to use the pipeline in the transit corridor to accommodate additional volumes of, ga of Russian gas, taking advantage of the EU legislation that requires uh, pipelines or pipeline consortiums to grant third party access to other gas suppliers. Oh, user. <laughs> you will lose. Yes, that's right. And, uh, and the, the uh, third goal is to somehow resurrect the South Stream's uh, branch that was to have terminated in Italy. It is the fact is frequently overlooked that Ukraine transits gas not only to Germany and to Central Europe, but it transits 25 BCM per year to Italy. And Gazprom would have to find an alternative route to Italy other than Ukraine if Gazprom is to bypass Ukraine. So the question is how to reroute those 25 BCM to Italy, which now enter Italy via Gazprom, the Slovak corridor, Austria, and southwards into Italy. Gazprom would like to do this in one of two ways using Turkish Stream. Yeah. Using Turkish Stream. Either to uh, route Turkish Stream to Greece and there put at least 10 BCM of Russian gas in, into the southern corridor to Italy or alternatively, to resurrect the, the westbound branch of South Stream by using the pre-existing project, a project uh, known as ITGI, a joint project of the Greek Desfa company with the Italian Edison company, which was in competition with Nabucco and in competition with the Southern Corridor, lost that competition, and Gazprom would like to reactivate that project in order to put its gas into Ukraine. So the purposes behind Turkish Stream, to some extent, recall those behind South Stream, but in an updated and modified version. And to conclude, uh, Russian gas supplies under privileged conditions uh, markets locked by uh, Gazprom, as well as traditional transit routes for Russian gas remain the main obstacle to the European Union's market integration, liberalization, and the goal that Amos Hochstein mentioned earlier, the goal, not the reality, but the goal of a European energy union. These old traditional Gazprom arrangements remain the main obstacle to that. And the second uh, lesson, more wide ranging and certainly political and strategic, uh, we face the risk whereby Russia and Germany would increasingly integrate their economies and create on the German side a permanent structure of vested interests in a special relationship with Russia. This also generates entrenched corruption structures, which we have already begin to see, begun to see in Germany. And will in the future, if this relations amplifies, will in the future significantly complicate transatlantic relations. Nord Stream and its a companion project, South Turkish Stream, 
are not merely Ukrainian transit issues. They are European strategic issues. They are political issues of European affairs. They are Europe-Russia issues. They are transatlantic solidarity issues. And for this reason, it would be advisable for the United States to appoint a high-level uh, coordinator or envoy for European energy security affairs, not to lobby for US LNG. In fact, US LNG should not even figure on the agenda of such a coordinator, but to make sure that Germany, first of all Germany, does not fall into over-dependency on Russian gas, to blow the whistle on corrupt interests in Germany, and to make sure that Ukraine's economy remains viable and can sustain the political and military assault of Russia. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Vlad. Um, I'm going to open up the floor for questions in a moment, but uh, before I do, uh, I'd like to actually play devil's advocate for a minute, if you'd allow me. Uh, it seems to me like the entire afternoon we've been hearing two almost parallel storylines here. On the one hand, uh, Nord Stream is a threat to Ukrainian pipeline uh, network, very clearly. Um, there's a danger that Nord Stream will uh, create greater leverage over the uh, German government and other Eastern European governments, uh, same with Turk Stream in the south. Um, However, there also seems to be a longer-term positive story being told here. Um, uh, let me throw out a few extra uh, pieces of data here to uh, add to this discussion. Um, this year, uh, the Polish uh, gas company PGNIG expects to uh, deliver approximately 800 million cubic meters of gas to Ukraine. Uh, it, ex it only expects this to rise next year. Um, Eastern European countries are constantly building new uh, pipeline interconnectors, and uh, importantly, the EU is uh, helping finance those. Uh, there's the gas interconnector Poland-Lithuania, which the EU is funding 60%. Uh, the Baltic pipeline from Scandinavia to Poland is uh, being planned. Uh, the um, Finland-Estonia interconnector, 75% uh, EU-funded. Um, and at the same time, LNG is growing uh, worldwide. Um, it grew 12% year on year uh, in 2016. Uh, Australia is expected to outpace Qatar as the largest uh, LNG uh, provider in the next two years, potentially. Um, Poland's uh, uh, company, PGNIG, which I just mentioned, is uh, planning to renegotiate the gas price with uh, uh, Gazprom very soon. Um, and then thanks to the uh, LNG facility, which uh, we talked about earlier in Klaipeda, uh, the price that Lithuania has been paying for Russian gas dropped by 45% between 2014 and uh, 2016. So considering all these uh, long-term trends, um, can you explain why uh, the United States should be as concerned about uh, Nord Stream to Extreme? Are the trends in long-term uh, such that uh, Russia is going to lose uh, its dominance here. Uh, and uh, who would like to uh, begin with uh, that question? Keith. Well, I'm concerned because, first of all, I kind of, I agree with, with Vlad that uh, just because the Social Democrats are going to be out of the coalition in Germany that we can relax as far as Nord Stream and German support for Nord Stream. I was in Germany before the first Nord Stream 1 was built. I went over to the, I think it was an Alexanderplatz, the Association of German Industries went in there and asked him about why they supported Nord Stream 1, and they gave me this long thing about which basically said that we, our pipeline companies and our, and our pumping stations are going, our pumping facilities are going to make a lot of money. And they said, Angela Merkel, they were very open about it, Angela Merkel opposed this, but we went to her and we said, you want to continue to get business contributions to the CD, CDU CDS coalition, then you support Nord Stream 1. She opposed it at first when she, before she came into office, and they put enormous pressure on her. I see no reason why they might do, not do that again. So I'm not quite as, as optimistic that, in fact, the, uh, 
the uh, Nord Stream is as much in trouble as we, we hope. I would also mention that uh, the composition of, of Gazprom lobbyists are, are quite powerful in Brussels. I remember there was a group that came through I was, when I was with CSIS that were telling us why, what the joys of South Stream were going to be. And every one of those members were uh, former officials of the European Commission. Every one. Every one was a member. And they were telling us how the, the South Stream was going to be a wonderful thing for Europe. And I think these same people, many of these same people, are still going around Europe and maybe here arguing for the joys of, of Nord Stream 2. So I think we have to be a little careful uh, in, in, in thinking that this is all going to disappear. I think there's a lot of other things that I think that the, some of the countries in Europe need to ramp up their own production to undercut the coalition, a coalition on pipelines between Germany and Russia. And I think that Poland and Ukraine have been remiss in kind of developing more domestic production. Uh, Poland, in fact, and Ukraine both had large, um, large Western energy companies there uh, three years ago, four years ago. Every big company was in those two countries. Everyone has left. Everyone has left. Because they weren't encouraged, even if there was a little bit of an economic reason not to drill at that moment, none of them, none of these companies, and I talked to all of them, none of them were given encouragement to stay in Poland and Ukraine to try to maintain a, a, a presence so that when the price of fracked oil and gas went down, they would be in a good position to help production in those countries. So part of it is these countries need to pull up their socks, I think, and try to, because increasing domestic demand will undercut the ability of Germany and Russia to have a, a consortium which would maintain high prices and control. The last thing I would mention is, what well, well, two more things. One is that I think the U.S. could provide some technical assistance from American companies on the whole issue of uh, hydraulic fracturing to, in Poland and Ukraine. The price of those things, those, those processes that I mentioned before has gone down over 50% in the last four years. And the last thing I would say is uh, some, somebody here mentioned corruption. Well, corruption, if I, I would recommend that you get online and look at the uh, still relevant studies that Roman Kubczynski, who passed away a few years ago, Roman did some wonderful studies of, of uh, corruption in the German en energy companies and in European energy companies. Very good. And I think, quite frankly, his studies uh, hold up today, many years later. I think there's another under-reporting of corruption in the energy field. We had a lot of it, say, 10 years ago, but a lot of that's uh, been diminished. And part of it is because, quite frankly, Roman passed away. And everybody, they lost his files. People around him lost his files. And, but he had a lot of evidence. And he had evidence, in fact, from discussions within Moscow, I'll have to say within energy, energy people within Moscow. Anyway, anyway, those things, I'm a little, less optimistic uh, because of the, uh, the CDU not being part of the coalition, but I think there's a lot of other things we can do uh, from not only looking at corruption, but also providing technical assistance and encouraging these companies, countries uh, to come back and look at the, some of the cheaper ways of, of increasing domestic production. Add something about uh, the more positive outlook um, and uh, more pessimistic one. I remember when the discussion was going on about South Stream, and the European Union was, the European Commission was determined that this project does not correspond with the third energy package and cannot proceed. Uh, there is, um, they didn't stop it on the basis of the third energy package. It was very interesting. Uh, it was stopped because the Bulgarian Bulgar gas has established a joint venture with Gazprom uh, with enormous power to, uh, uh, to not only to construct the project but also to operate the project with, without a tender in violation of EU competition rules. 
And the European Commission started the procedure against the Bulgarian government. Uh, they have this uh, letter and then uh, penalties and so on. Well, that procedure stopped the project. Not, not even the threat that uh, Bulgarian companies, which are working with uh, Timchenko, was awarded actually the contract to build South Stream pipelines in Bulgaria and Macedonia. Not the threat that American companies are not going to work or uh, going to sanction Bulgarian companies working with Timchenko, but that simple rule, anti-monopolistic rule of the European Union. The, the, my point is, if there is a will, there is, there is a way, and European Union can do uh, everything uh, that they need to do to stop the project. Question is whether the, the will is going to hold up. Uh, yes, we have a question right down here in the front. Well, it's, it's sort of, sorry, how about it, Matthew Council? I actually wanted to um, talk your question. I mean, because there is the kind of legit, what's, if you like, the counter argument is to say all this infrastructure is being built and the market is being open and therefore, you know, all is well. I think the answer to that question, the answer to that is that these things all take a tremendously a long amount of time. And although, of course, it is true that the EU is providing some funding, the, uh, the point Amos was making earlier is that once you've built the infrastructure, the ability to build Nord Stream 2, the ability to then get the additional private financing to proceed diminishes. And the, the, the other two points of this is that if you have Nord Stream 2 built, Remember, what you get with Nord Stream 2 is you have, uh, you've already got the Opel pipeline at full power now, going through uh, eastern Germany and into the Czech Republic with 36 billion cubic meters. Then if you add in uh, a Nord Stream 2 with 55 billion cubic meters, following the same path with Eugal, so that's 90 billion cubic meters heading into uh, central and eastern Europe. The problem you've got is you've actually built all those interconnectors from west to east, funded by the EU, which uh, was supposed to bring LNG, Norwegian gas, and everything else. And essentially, the Russians flood all those interconnectors, so nobody else can get in. And if you look at the Yogal pipeline, it's currently, the, the, the way it's been done, and I think there are quite legal questions about that, but the point about it is, is that all the, all the capacity has been sold to Gazprom until 2039. So you're locking in all the interconnectors. So the, the, once you begin to under, uh, appreciate that, you begin to appreciate your locking out Central and Eastern Europe. And my single market point I was making to Amos earlier is, was, was that what actually the single market point is, is so immensely strong in this because what you're essentially doing is dividing the European Union market. So you have on one side, you have a liberalized Northwestern European market. On the other, you're going almost going back to the past of a closed Gazprom dominated Central and Eastern Europe. So that that is why, you know, when you the argument, in fact, the argument you use is the argument the Gazprom lobbyists use. Well, because of the open European market now and it's flexible and it's wonderful. But in fact, Nord Stream 2 does the opposite. It closes it down and it restores by new means the status quo as it was, say, in 2000. Observation. And it's coming from the north. Coming from the north instead of coming from the east. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Jonas Moloska, Naftagas. If I may, I would like to add uh, in another perspective to this. We cannot just say to Germany and to our other partners of Gazprom that you have to give up something which is very lucrative to you. We have to put something on the table on the other side. And uh, as, uh, as Mr. Smith has men mentioned, there are plenty of opportunities, including for German companies, to extract gas in Ukraine, to extract gas in Poland. We, uh, uh, at Naftagas, we have... Uh, applied the strategy of uh, expanding our gas production. In the past year, we have done 50 fracking operations. All of them were successful. And we already see increase in gas production in, uh, in, in our subsidiary company. So this is something Russia has for years locked the Central European market, including Ukraine. 
And uh, we are now striving to open it up for everybody, for the Western Europe, for the American companies. And this could be something which would add more interest to preventing this domination of Russia in the European gas market. I think I saw a hand over here. Is that yes, uh, the gentleman in the second row? Thanks. Uh, Vlad Muzilev, Embassy of Ukraine. So I guess it's absolutely clear from our discussion, so the nature of uh, Nord Stream 2 projects, so it's a political nature, not commercial, so it's absolutely clear. And also it's clear, I guess, for everyone that uh, uh, Russian oil and gas industry is the main source of financial resources uh, to fuel war in Ukraine, in Syria, to uh, make a, a huge, uh, like, um, attempts to... Uh, uh, to press on uh, European countries or even on the, on the United States. So, and uh, while taking that, uh, so we're talking about like putting in one line uh, uh, lives of peoples who are like suffering, who, who are killed by uh, Russians and uh, the interests of some European companies. Maybe they are big and influential, yeah, it's clear. But uh, we are putting at the same line the lives of the people and uh, the interest losses or profits of the companies. So that's why I guess uh, it's absolutely clear that uh, according to uh, Section 232 of uh, CATSA Act, uh, so United States uh, the, uh, is looking for unity, transatlantic unity with uh, the European nations. And it's also absolutely clear because of uh, position of some European countries that it will be extremely difficult to find that unity. So that's why uh, I guess uh, that uh, United States in this situation should take more active role, even proactive, so and to info, uh, implement uh, sanctions against uh, Russian energy export pipelines, so like at the first step. And I guess uh, after that, uh, other countries, I hope European countries will will add uh, their uh, sanctions also, as it was before, like uh, with other sanctions. Uh, uh, with respect to situation in Ukraine. Thanks. Hey, any other questions? Yes, uh, and anybody else? I'd like to bundle them if possible, but go ahead. And that'll be the last one then. Thank you. So there is Umbri Embassy of Hungary. And I have a question related to Creek LNG Terminal. Uh, so in the long history of the project, uh, we haven't been that close to kind of actually like realize the project. Uh, there are some many, like many positive steps, but also some disturbing factors lately. Uh, so I would like to really hear your take, like what you think about uh, whether this terminal will realize or not. In Croatia. About uh, Croatia, we've been. Uh, watching the Kirk project for many years. Uh, it never seemed to move ahead. My own personal impression, having watched this for many years, my own personal impression was that uh, the Croatian government did not quite know what to make of it. I think that Croatia does not have that much experience in energy sector and in negotiating with big international players. Croatia was never uh, located on any major transit routes. The Croatian government was overly preoccupied and still is uh, with fighting against uh, Hungarian mold over control of the national uh, oil and gas company uh, INA. In some, there was, and there still is, stagnation on that front. What Kirk could achieve would be to send seven BCM per year in an already existing double directional pipeline between Croatia and Hungary. That volume would be more than sufficient to resolve the problems of, UK, of Hungary's energy supplies. Hungary's energy consumption is down from 12 BCM per year just a few years ago to 8 BCM per year now, thanks primarily to conservation measures. Those have been very effective in Hungary, building insulation, 
uh, energy savings in industry, a very effective program under the Orban government of, uh, of um, uh, energy savings. So consumption is down, 8 BCM per year. 7 BCM or a portion of the 7 BCM from Croatia would make a significant difference. According to existing plans, another portion of Croatian uh, regasified LNG would go to Slovakia because Slovakia also risks falling out of the Russian uh, 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 transit route. The 7 BCM pipeline from Croatia to Hungary is the counterpart of a 5 BCM pipeline from Romania to Hungary, also bidirectional. That pipeline also could contribute in a major way to resolving Hungary's supplies problems away from Gazprom. But Romania would have to allow gas exports, that is the east-west direction of that pipeline, to be opened. Until recently, Romania has argued that it must keep significant volumes of gas in the country in order to keep the price of gas down on the national market. But those two, trans those two interconnectors, Croatia-Hungary, Romania-Hungary, are a central part of the European Union's interconnector building program in Central Europe. And those two interconnectors could resolve Hungary's most uh, intractable dilemma. Hungary alone is not on any major transit route if Gazprom stops sending gas to Ukraine. Hungary is the only country that remains up in the air. This is sometimes not understood in the West when Viktor Orban is being blamed for, re for prolonging his gas uh, contracts with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Russia. Until Hungary is relieved from this in the air position via to those, those two interconnectors, then Hungary, the problem will be resolved. Vlad, in uh, 20 seconds or less, do you think the Three Cs initiative would provide any additional impetus to the Kirk? Uh, do I think what? The, the three, Cs. three Cs initiative would provide any additional impetus. Which three Cs, the uh, Polish-Croatian uh, uh, regional. Oh, Three Cs, the Three Cs. Well, the Three Cs initiative is largely a political and symbolic framework. It does encourage and favor and promote functional cooperation in various economic sectors. But the Three Cs initiative is basically a symbolic political framework. However, there is a north-south corridor, with, as you rightly mentioned, uh, projected to run from uh, Poland via Slovakia to Hungary and to connect with Croatia. And that uh, corridor has a chance of materializing since uh, Poland, in June of this year, for the first time, starting importing uh, significant volumes of LNG through the Svino Oistje uh, terminal on the Baltic Sea. In June of this year, the first LNG cargo from the United States arrived in Poland. But prior to this, Poland already had, uh, has a contract with Qatar. Uh, Projected capacity 5 BCM per year, it could easily be uh, up, upscaled to 7 BCM per year, and volumes from that, uh, from that terminal could make their way down in small volumes, in small portions, to the aforementioned countries and even to Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine would have to build a 120 kilometer interconnector on its own territory in order to link up with the pipeline that comes down from Svinovishchi. All right, thank you very much. Round of applause for our panelists.